Welcome back to the Speaking and Communicating Podcast. I am your host, Roberta. If you are looking to improve your communication skills, both professionally and personally, this is the podcast you should be tuning into. Communication skills help you with your career growth and leadership development. The Speaking and Communicating Podcast is part of the B Podcast Network, which helps you become the leader that you want to see. To learn more about the B Podcast Network, go to bpodcastnetwork.com. My guest today uses gardening and trees as metaphors to help you get unstuck and do the things that you know you need to do to create the life that you desire. Alison Smith is a trainer, coach, and author, and he, her latest book is Can See the Wood for the Trees. And before I go any further, please help me welcome her to the show. Hi, Alison. Hi, Roberta. Great to be here. I'm glad you are here. You bring such wonderful energy. Thank you for being here. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> welcome. Yes. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm a coach. I mean, you've, you've done a really good introduction. Um, I started way back when in business, in procurement. So I was a buyer and in the late 90s realized that <laughs> the managers we were trying to engage with weren't as interested in supplier management as we were <laughs> and I, that's when I started using metaphor and I used the so you mentioned gardening suddenly rather than trying to engage these people with um, getting interested about supplier management we could say well gardens need mowing you know mowing weeding the plants need feeding, they need pruning, time in the greenhouse. And suddenly these managers' brains went, uh, oh, that's what we need to be doing for the suppliers. We need to be managing the suppliers. And I've just been plonking suppliers in the corner of the garden and then berating those suppliers for not growing. And yet the soil wasn't right. We've not been paying any attention. And so that's when it all started. And then I suppose I went went off and learned all about metaphor and then I've, I've, I suppose gone off at a tangent and now do soft skills training and um, yeah coaching around specifically around helping people get unstuck. Mm -hmm. What is it about metaphors and what I would say I was raised Christian so you know the Bible's got all these yeah. parables from Jesus yeah. Actually, the other day, my mom said, because I said to her, oh, mom, I've been looking everywhere, and I actually really got dizzy. And the first thing she said was, like the 10 virgins, <laughs> they were going around. You know what yeah. I mean? No matter how much or how long you last heard the story, it, it, why are they always at our fingertips, these parables and metaphors? Well, I say that, you know, we, there's the phrase about a picture paints a thousand words. Well, a, ma a, a metaphor paints a thousand pictures. But mm. I think there's also something that it resonates with a deeper part of us because actually stories go back millennia, you know. So, and actually we've used stories, you know, our ancestors used stories to share like the Bible in terms of, you know, insights, learning. This is, this is you know, values, beliefs. And, and they used stories because they talk at a deeper level. So it's not having to be retained in our memory somewhere. It's there's a real a metaphor going on that's real inside us that we're able to more easily um, access. Because mm. whether you believe in the religion, whether the story yeah. came from or not, you you still people tweet yeah. these stories that there's something about them that is just long staying that it has long staying power so to speak absolutely i mean i mean yes. that's why in speaking people say tell people a story start with a story people you know end with a story people relate to the story they might not remember the five points you know I, here's the five points you need to remember but they'll remember the story and therefore that as long as those five points are contained within the story then people will go oh yeah that was the one about me focusing or that was the one be, about me being clear about knowing what my goal is or whatever. Mm. And then when it comes to these metaphors, you said you help people get unstuck. Do you sometimes feel like when we feel stuck, it's because we really don't know what to do next or we might have an idea. Maybe we can Google something, but we just don't take that leap. Yeah, I, th I think 
You see, I, I also say words have power. And as soon as we start saying we're stuck, we're, t we're taking power away from ourselves because we're saying I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. There are no other options. I've tried everything. There is nothing else I can do. So, it's, so our language sort of reinforces our beliefs. Um, but you're right. I absolutely believe there's a part of us that does know what to do. And you're right. Sometimes it might be the fact that we're fearful of that or or we haven't. I had somebody the other week where, you know, I'm at a crossroads, I'm at a crossroads. So we were out in nature embodying this at every crossroads. I was saying, so which direction do you want to go? But it came quite apparent during the conversation that they weren't at a crossroads because they mm. hadn't left that the yet. They weren't ready yet to leave the destination previously. So they're going, oh, but I've got a decision to make. Yeah, but it doesn't matter how long you talk about making this decision, you're not yet prepared to leave. It was a place of work. I'm not prepared to leave the job you're at currently. So we need to work on that first. So, yes, sometimes there's an order in which we need to uh, go on the journey in order for us to to move towards what we want but quite often it's a, the belief that there are no options that my tools and techniques throw up in the air <laughs> or so sometimes we know we haven't we're not ready to decide we haven't decided yeah absolutely. So there's a fear of taking of saying okay i'm going to do this i'm going to make that leap that yes. and then we say it, it's I'm, I'm feeling stuck sorry go ahead Yes. And I think quite often if we're using things like can't see the wood for the trees because I'm looking for the language people are using when they're stuck, you know, can't see the wood for the trees or can't see the woods for the trees or can't see the forest for the trees, depending on what country you're in, might resonate better. Mm. But when we're using that phrase, we're also saying I'm overwhelmed. You know, I don't have access to my logical brain because this is just too confusing. I'm lost. So in some respects, the first thing we need to do when people are stuck is exactly as you've said, really, is address the underlying, whether it's fear, confusion, um, whatever the feeling is, because it's that that in some respects is stopping them seeing the, the options that are available. Mm. And so when we talking about the, you, you know, you use the trees metaphor, uh -huh. Why couldn't you choose something different? Why the trees? Why gardens? Um, you could you could do anything because people are using when they're stuck. People might say oh, it feels like I'm on a merry-go-round or I'm on a carousel or um, so. We do use metaphor. What I what I've tuned my ears to hear is the fact that people use nature metaphors or idioms all the time when they're stuck. Stuck mm. in a rut, going round in circles, uphill struggle, between stuck between a rock and a hard place, I'm at a crossroads. So all I did was go, well, okay, we're using the, the, that metaphor when we're stuck. So I'm going to mine that metaphor for solutions, and then we'll come back to the problem later. Because I invariably use the language the person's um using so in my uh, podcast i go out into nature i embody so if it's an uphill struggle i will struggle uphill in order to get insight or if it's treading water i'll go into the sea, very cold sea here in scotland and tread water to get insight um but the, the the whole idea being is the fact that by embodying it we get insight that that we're not aware of mm -hmm. So we I think see... for me, yeah, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. Well, it's just the fact that we can, nature's there. Most of us, you know, we were talking earlier about the fact before the session started, the fact that, you know, most of us have got some sort of nature on our doorstep. I can see a tree right through the store, yeah, yes. That, yeah, <laughs> so, so actually, rather than just doing it in your head, you could go to that tree and go, okay, so what is this tree, wood, forest telling me about the situation I can't see the wood for the trees about? And you'll, you'll notice a path, or you'll go, you know what, I'm really bored with all those trees bar this one, so why am I worried about the whole wood? I just need to focus on this one tree. Or... Yeah, I just need to follow this path out. Let's find out what happens if I follow this path out. Mm. 
Can you give us an example of someone you coach where they felt stuck and you use this metaphor and how they were able to have a breakthrough? Yes, the um one of one of the well there's there's quite a few, but so I suspect the one story will will merge with a few people's, but there was one person who felt like they were going round in circles, and we were in a wood, there was about, I don't know, five or six leaders all doing different things in the wood relating to what I'm talking about. But this particular one was going round in circles. So I asked him to go and in, in a particular area of his life. And I think it was about what he wanted to do with his business. But it's that whole, I'm not making any decisions because I keep not making a decision, really. So I'm just going round and round, keep saying, I want to make a decision and I'm not making a decision. Say, I want to make a decision and I'm not making it. So, uh, and I did say, you know, which of these sayings best describes how you feel? You know, can't see the wood for the trees, stuck in a rut. No, no, it's going round in circles. So I have, have quite often have somebody walking around in circles and I said, so what direction do you want to go? Oh, that one. I mean, he knew instantly which direction he wanted to go. Right. I said, well, OK, so let's walk. Let's see what happens when you walk in that direction. So so he starts walking in the direction he wants to go. And then he got so far and then it was, well, I'm not sure this is the right direction. I said, well, where do you want to go? Oh, well, I know where I want to go. But and then he and then he noticed um, a bridge in the opposite direction. Oh, but that bridge looks exciting. And I said, but you're just distracting yourself because where do you want to go? I want to go in that direction. So what happens when we're out in nature, in my in my opinion, is we bring the patterns we run in the real life situation with mm. us into the into the landscape. So he obviously in that particular instance is. <laughs> is allowing himself to get to, to get distracted. And this is actually comes up quite often where, oh, well, well, this path, what about this path? But you know, you want to get to the other side of the wood. So why are you worrying about the wood? Because I, I can't tell you how often when I say, where do you want to go? The conviction with which people say there, they can point mm. to it. They know where it is. So why, why are you allowing yourself? Are you to looking at the bridge? Yeah, why are you looking at the bridge? Why are you getting distracted by all of these other paths? Let's put, you know, let's put imaginary uh, no entry signs up all these other paths. Um, you know, so it's that that sort of thing. I mean, another example is somebody who um, was at the crossroads. Uh, well, I believe they were at a crossroads within their um, job. They were talking to people about what sort of job they wanted. And um, so anyway, we were in a botanical gardens in Edinburgh. Every crossroads we came to, because there was lots of paths cutting over, it was was brilliant for finding crossroads. And um, every crossroads we got to, it was, you know, I asked him, look, which direction do you want to go? But he always chose the path that hadn't got a signpost. So it's as if we get to a crossroads and three of the paths had got, you know, signposts saying... Right this here, this here. And there was always one, it seemed, where we were, which was quite amusing, because I don't think there is as many of them without signposts as we came across. Mm -hmm. But he wanted to go on the one that hadn't got a signpost. And what that enabled him to understand about his job was that he was applying for jobs where people had already gone down the paths, had already put the signposts up. And that's not what that's not what gave him joy. What gave him joy was going down a path nobody else had gone down, making the signposts for others to follow. So it just meant that how he was embodying it in nature enabled him to go back and go, I'm applying for the wrong jobs. Mm, I'm a trendsetter. I'm not a follower. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and sometimes it's like um, <laughs> quite often we go on about, oh, I want to go on paths less travelled. Yeah. <laughs> but is that you? <laughs> it well, sounds like yeah, a great idea because sometimes the sometimes great ideas don't necessarily mean that is who you are innately. Yeah, and, and it was really funny because I was in nature, I was in a wood, and um, you know, I like to think that I'm a you know paths less traveled, but I'm a paths less traveled on a field. You know, I, I'm OK if it's a field and I've got 360 degrees worth of, you know, options. 
and I can just go, oh, I'll go this, you know, I'll go east today instead of west. That's my path less travelled. When I was in a wood and I was faced with all this bramble and overgrowth and, you know, roots in the ground, I'm mm -hmm. looking at this and going, that's not a path that I want, you know, paths less travelled, it'll still remain less travelled. I'm not going there. And so it gave me huge insight at the time about I'm not somebody that wants to brandish a, you know, something to cut all the undergrowth back and sort of swipe through the undergrowth. But some people would be. And I think that's the that's why I love metaphor, because I can think one thing logically. I can have this belief about myself. And then I go out into nature and it's and because because logic isn't there to critique it, mm. you can sort of notice the pattern, sort of understand the pattern, relate to the pattern. And then once you've done all that, then go, oh, I see, that's what that means. And logic is sort of gone with you a bit. So logic isn't resisting the, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a path layer unless it's just on a field. <laughs> Listen, logic has its place. Yes. But do you feel that sometimes logic is the reason people do describe themselves as stuck? Yes. I mean, I, I'm, and is the reason why we're stuck quite often because, um, you know, the whole reason I got, well, one of the reasons I got into using metaphor is that my logic will run rings around me. Because if I believe that that person's the awkward so and so, or I should be doing this, logic will def my logic will run rings round and defend that belief that that's the, the other person's to blame or this is the way I should be going whereas metaphor enables me to go hang on a minute logic you have you, you know my logic's brill but it's great when it's when it knows what it wants to do it, but it defends things I think too much so I say let's send logic on a coffee break let's send a story and all the you know, this person said that. And because sometimes you can have, you know, ask a friend, you know, you know, how are you? And they'll tell you about a problem. And all they do is just tell you all the reasons why they're stuck and nothing about the solution. And you do find the evidence for whatever you believed <laughs> first. Yeah. All, all the evidence is there. All the, <laughs> all yeah. the proof is there how yeah. right you are. Yeah. So, so I say, and I, at one point I tried sending logic on a holiday but but logic doesn't want to go on holiday and logic isn't happy because a holiday is too long. So what we have to say to our logical minds is logic, you're going on a coffee break, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Mm. And then we're going to have some gorgeous ideas for you to plan and do something with. So we're coming back to you. We haven't forgotten you. Um, but we would like you to go for that coffee break and have a chat with somebody else. while Sit we at go. Starbucks. Yeah. 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 Sort of. And it's, you know, quite often in workshops, then I'll make sure that we've got a coffee machine, you know, and I put lo the word logic by the coffee machine. And I'm always going, that's where logic is. Because there's a part of us that does know what to do, but we just have to allow logic to dial down. And I mean, that's not for everybody because metaphor isn't for everybody. But right. anybody that's like me, <laughs> who can be a bit awkward and a bit dig my heels in when people are coming up with new ideas... Or, or when we're stuck, because if we're stuck, then, you know, our whole language is I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. It's an uphill struggle. I don't want to struggle. Um, and, you know, words have power. So let's use our words to find solutions rather than use the words to reinforce our stuckness. Mm -hmm. Because that will definitely keep us stuck. So tell us a little bit about your podcast. You mentioned it earlier, Landscaping Your Life with Alison Smith. When you started your podcast, what what was the motivation behind that? Um, bizarrely, I think it was because, <laughs> because I had a vision of getting the, the process out to more people and thought the podcast would be able to do that. What I've also realized is that I've it, it's morphed. I'm on series three. I've sort of do it a little differently now than I did initially. So initially it was quite theoretical in terms of I sat in the office I tell you what I'd learned from doing it with other people which was great 
but I wasn't as excited about it as I have been for series two and three when mm. I go out and I go, right, if you if you think that like you know a particular situation feels like an uphill struggle, then let me go and go up on it uphill for you and struggle and let's notice what we notice about potential solutions if it's an uphill struggle. Like, oh look, there's some steps there, that'll be easier. Or do I even want to get to the top of the hill? So so when I'm there, so it's just me in the podcast, mm. um, and I just explore the landscape. So recently I've done one about coming out of the shadows. And so you'd use that phrase when you're sort of hiding a little bit, you're not perhaps speaking up, you're not getting yourself out there in the world as much as you might be. So you're hiding in the shadows. Um, the reason I get so excited in the podcast is what happens is, is that I uncover things I'm not expecting. So because if I was going out and just reeling off what what we already know might the solution be, well, what's the point of me doing that? You know, so mm. I go out into nature and find things, you know, like a dead end, for instance. It's like dead ends are very rarely dead and they're very rarely an end. So let's change the language because the name of the, you know, by saying I'm at a dead end, we're telling ourselves a whole load of information that is inaccurate. So let's change the language. Coming out of the shadows was, again, it's me going, so it has to be what's happening in my life. So it's not always going to resonate with everybody, which is why I always say, go and find some shadows for you to hide into and see what you notice. But in this particular instance, it was that, you know, I was, it was a bit boring in, in the shadows because I was in the wood and, mm. and it's like, oh, I'm looking around, okay, nobody else here, it's a bit dark, it's a bit boring. Yeah, yeah, okay, I do want to go out, come out of the shadows into the sun. And I imagined that going out into the sun would be hot, that it's as if when, we're, when we say, oh, oh, I, oh, I don't want to go out of the shadow, you know, I need to go out the shadows, but I don't want to do it. It's as if I think we think there's going to be a spotlight and everybody's going to be looking at us as soon as we go out of the shadows, which is why we stay in the shadows. Because it's like, oh, I don't want, I'm not it's ready for safe. the spotlight. Yet. Mm. Yeah, I'm not ready for the spotlight. Um, I'm not going to be able to cope when I get there. But what happened, which shocked me, was I sort of got out of the shadows, so into the non-shadow, as I call it, and then there was somebody walking past and they said, morning. I said, oh, hello. And then as I walked down the street, it's like everybody was going about their day. It's like the builders were doing the building. The postman was delivering his letters. The kids were going to school. And it was, so why am I in the shadows where it's lonely and dark and nobody's there? And even yeah. I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. So I'm if so I funny. come out of the if I come out of the shadows, it's not I'm not gonna nobody's gonna pounce on me. Nobody's even noticing, really. I can just go about my day and do what I do, but I'll do it out here in life rather than hide away. So I think that's the power of metaphor, really, that we can embody it. And we will, and this is why I always encourage, you know, start every podcast by saying, look, if you can, if you can go out into nature and do this at the same time as me, you're going to get more from it. And you're going to get more from it if you can think of a situation that resonates. So don't listen to, you know, don't go to my podcast and listen to coming out of the shadows episode if that doesn't resonate with how you're feeling, because mm. you'll listen to it and it'll be an academic exercise and you'll just go, it's a load of whatever. Whereas if you pick a, a an episode, and currently, as I say, there's two, so there's about 40 episodes where the title is an idiom that we use when we're stuck. Pick the idiom that best describes the situation you'd like more insight on. And I can guarantee you'll get more, more from it. And then you might go, oh, actually, let me go and listen to some of the others. Um, but you do need, you do, in order to get the most from it, you do need to think of a situation that, that um, that idiom describes mm, how you are feeling right now because you know how especially those psychometric tests the myers-briggs and everything they 
if you filled one now versus 20 years ago, you'll have a very different result because you were feeling differently and looking at life differently back then. Yeah. Yes, it's think of a situation. I always say, think of a situation you'd like more insight about. It could be that a problem you're grappling with. It could just be a, you know, I'd quite like to do that, but I'm not doing that in this situation. So think of that situation and then look at the is it uphill struggle? Is it, you know, at a crossroads? Is it a corner to turn? Mm -hmm. And once you've chosen the idiom, then it's, you know, have a listen. Um, you know, all the podcast episodes have a blog to go with it. So invariably there's more resource because I'll have either done a video blog on it or, um, yeah, all sorts of bits and bobs of information um, that, that mm. links to it. But it's, but for me, and, and then what I've done this second, the third series is added poems into the mix. So what I'm doing at the end of, of recording is writing a poem that sort of brings the insights together, which seems to work. So it's sort of adding another layer, really. So you've got the metaphorical shift, then you've got the poetic shift, however, you know, you relate to that. Right. Um, just to add, add to that, really. Mm -hmm. What exactly is the landscape problem solving toolkit? Um. That's just various different. So the landscape stands for, and that now I'd need to. You've got me on the hop, really. It's like, oh, what, what do they all stand for? But um, L is language, um, A is analogy and metaphor. So it's various. So so it's an acronym that mm -hmm. um, is all the different tools I use. So laughter's in there, absurdity's in there. Um, so it's just different NLPs in there, storytelling's in there, poetry's in there. So I just use the acronym to, to actually put all of the different tools that I use. Collage is in there um, as a mechanism to say, yeah, if you're working with me, then, yeah, we might go out into nature. And to be fair, I, have, I haven't I have done anybody in Atlanta, but I have had somebody recently in L.A., somebody in right. Florida, where I'm at the other end of the phone. They're walking around in a landscape wherever they are, and they're just telling me. But I might, for instance, the other week, I was doing a talking to a brick wall um, workshop, and I got everybody to draw the brick wall that best described the situation they were thinking of. So drawing might be in there. Because basically what you do is um, think of a person that you feel like you're talking to a brick wall about, draw the brick wall. So, you know, it might be in colour, not colour. might be on a little post-it note. It might be on a full paper. It might be on a um, flip chart. But draw the wall. And then the idea is, so now what changes do you make to the wall? So you might want to draw a different wall. You might want to add things to this wall. So you might want to add a ladder to this wall. You might want to have a series of pictures where you imagine the wall, putting some dynamite under the wall, the dynamite blowing up, the wall falling down, and then being able to see the person near the side of the wall. So drawing sometimes comes into it. Mm-hmm. It sounds like an exercise if you are married and you feel like your spouse is it's like talking to a brick wall if you want them to do something. It's an exercise well, you can... <laughs> the first, the, the first, well, we've all been there. The, <laughs> the first insight, though, mm -hmm. is what is grammatically wrong, wrong, sort of linguistically wrong with the phrase, it feels like I'm talking to a brick wall, is my question. Hmm. Because... When I then say, and some people get it when I ask that, the second question that gets most people there, which is, where are you and where is the other person? And as soon as I ask that question, people go, oh, the other person isn't a brick wall. The other person is the other side of the brick wall. Now, that's a, cute, that's a different problem, because if the person you're talking to is a brick wall, brick walls don't talk. So I understand that when we're saying that I'm talking to a brick wall, there is nothing to do because a brick wall is going to do nothing. Yeah. Whereas as soon as you change your representation in your head, that, oh, the better way of describing it is there is a brick wall between me and the other person. Then you can start taking ownership for what you do differently to either get over the wall, demolish the wall. I do have to add that sometimes walls are there for protection and we and they're there for good reasons. So sometimes mm -hmm. we may not want to demolish the wall. But 
as soon as we get the language clear, then we're more able to see solutions. In the same way as going back to that person who was at a crossroads, actually they they hadn't left their they hadn't made the decision to leave their current destination so they were nowhere near a crossroads so once we've got a language clear it's oh okay yeah i'd like to i'd like to make a decision about doing something different but i'm fearful about leaving where i am currently so let's let's have an action about how how can i become more comfortable about leaving my current employment then I can look at what decisions I might have because you suddenly because if you're if you're trying to make a decision from a place of fear of oh, I don't want to leave this place it's secure really, I know it I it, yes yeah you, you're not going to be making the right as, as broad you're not going to see as many options as there might be so for me it's been really clear about is how you the words you've used to describe the current situation are they accurate and what might be a more accurate way of doing it but if it's a metaphor then let's use the metaphor to try and uncover as i say things that you know options that are currently hidden from view it amazes me how you say it's the language when you think of you know when parents talk to their teenagers Oh, she doesn't listen. It's like talking to a brick wall or like I said, spouses. Oh, he just doesn't listen. It's like talking to a brick wall. We say that all the time yeah, yeah. and don't realize, wait a minute, the person is on the other side of the brick wall. Is that now the language that makes us feel like the situation is unsolvable? It's stuck. Yeah. Yeah, we're stuck. The other person is the problem because we're not the brick wall. I mean, the interesting thing is that when you're saying... You know, it's like talking to a brick wall. Then the other person is the brick wall. We're not the brick wall. They are. So they're the problem. As soon as you, because one of the questions I asked in this workshop was, how many walls do you know? Because once we'd realized it, there was a wall between us and the other person, I said, so how many walls do you know that have only got one side? No, 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 no. They've all got two sides. So they can see the brick wall. We can see the brick wall. The other question is about brick walls is how often are you, you know, I don't know, walking around in life and there's a brick wall suddenly appear as if from nowhere in the most obscure of places that they shouldn't be. Mm. Never. They're, you know, brick walls are always, you know, I'm looking out my, my window now. There's walls between me and the church next door. There's walls, you know, for protection, for climbing things up, for boundaries. So brick walls are there for a reason. So one of the things would be, what, why is the brick wall there? But sometimes it feels like, and actually I've got, <laughs> I've got the prop with me. So those on audio, I'm going to have to describe it, but it's a, um, it's oh, a there's the brick wall. Brick wall, brick wall made from um, wallpaper. So it's a two, mm -hmm. it is a two-sided one. But um, sometimes it feels like if if we really stick with the truth of the fact that brick walls don't appear from nowhere and there is a reason for most brick walls is it sometimes feels as if we've all dodged around to sort of put a brick wall between us and the other person so wherever they're standing it's like we're running around the garden trying to sort of make it so there's this brick wall between us and them um and and that's where the absurdity comes in from my landscape the, the fact that let's get silly with this because if we're because that's obviously not what's happened. But it's like, it really does enable us to go, so who even built the brick wall? In the story, sorry, in the poem I've written about brick walls, one of the lines is, sometimes that wall has been there too, longer than anybody remembers. We don't know why it's there. We don't know who put it there. And it just requires, I go, it just requires a head above the wall and a cheery, hello, how are you? Mm -hmm. And it's that, so I think it's, I think playing with the language and certainly playing with the metaphor just enables us to have a bit of fun. You know, so sometimes I might say, you know, if you feel like you're talking to a brick wall, then it might be, well, let's say I'm shouting at a inflatable wall or I'm lying before a, you know, I don't know, a pebble wall. And it's just playing with the words because all that does is it, if, the talking to the brick wall is what is telling our brain we're stuck. There are no options. By right. playing lightly and fun 
with the language, by going out into nature. All we're doing is, is I suppose, demolishing the walls around our belief that there's, you know, we're stuck. And it enables us to see other solutions. There's a lot that you've shared today where we're going to see things differently. And <laughs> one other thing <laughs> that, yeah, one other thing is in one of your videos, you say change your environment to change your thoughts, but we do it the other way around, which is change your thoughts and then the environment will change. Oh. You said change your environment to change your thoughts. Like I think the example you used was be creative to be creative and you feel stuck. You can go out to nature and maybe yeah. being in a different environment will change yeah. your thoughts. But we've heard, so, or maybe this is a metaphor for something different because you know how we hear so much of you change your thoughts, you change your mindset and then things around you will change. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and, and to be fair, I mean, that is what I, I suppose I've come at it from that belief because I did NLP Neuro Linguistic Programming. Right. I do talk about mindset a lot. And so it is about where's your mindset. I start most workshops with what mindset do you need to be in to get the most out of today? Um, so some some mindsets are easier to change than others. I think when we're stuck, there's a there's a difficulty because the mindset is already stuck and the language is stuck. So when I wrote "Can't see the wood for the trees," um, and because I talk and write a lot about being stuck, I absolutely notice that sometimes I get stuck because I'm writing about being stuck so much. So so I think there's a you know, we have to be careful. And therefore, if we go out, you know, I went, you know, COVID, I do a lot of work at home now, I live on my own. And I went to the dentist, you know, and so that was a change of environment. But and it was in Edinburgh. So it was city versus I live sort of more in the countryside. But it was just such a shock to the system. But I got so excited because I was having conversations with people. And it was just new information coming in. And I just think, we, you know, we do it differently. Each of us, if, if we're not comfortable with nature, then perhaps going to nature would be that thing. For me, last week, it was going into into city because I haven't been in the city for a while, you know. Mm -hmm. I, and the reason I brought up that phrase is because since you've described the work you do with your clients, when they are in the job they don't like, that's the environment. So when they go into nature and you say to them, let's take, you know, let's go through the signpost. So the crossroad, then the mind changed. So the environment came first. Yes. I mean, I think quite often, I mean, so, so in, in the procurement environment, because I still do some work in that, when we're mm. talking about creative problem solving, you know, and I say, so what tools do you use for creative problem solving? It's like, oh, brainstorming or whatever it's called these days. But it's, but it's in a grey meeting room with a conference table in the middle mm. and a flip chart and post-its. And it's, but is that really a creative environment? You know, does that really bring out? Because most people get ideas when they're in the shower. Now, I'm not suggesting we have group showers, you know. <laughs> so, no, absolutely not. No, no, not at all, Alison. <laughs> but... But what, but what I have done is with groups of individuals is we've gone into nature to do some problem solving. So, you know, when it's, um, in fact, I know you were saying that it, earlier that it was um, warm in Atlanta. The, um, we, 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 we went out one day when the first question that somebody asked before we left the offices was, has everybody got their uh, sun cream on? Because it was so warm out there. But we went out and yeah, we had people turning corners and doing all sorts of things. Uh, taking the shoes off and and but you know there was sort of 12 of us problem solving but in nature and it was a very different experience than in a gray meeting room with a you know flip chart or whatever because mm, the brain starts to open up and sees things differently yeah so Alison how do we sow seeds that will grow into the life that we dream of what a great question um I think I said in fact I'm going to repeat what I said to somebody yesterday because they've just left they've just moved house um I mean literally within the last 10 days they've moved house and they're going oh, I don't know what to do you know I don't know what to do I was expecting it all to be clear once I moved house and I've said 
but moving house was sowing the seeds. So you've sowed the seeds, but it's now with patience required. So you've done something different. You've changed the environment. But, you know, if you if you did sow a seed, you wouldn't be there the next morning after you've sowed it. Going, and you dig up the ground yeah, and like, you're, you're, are you growing a tree already? <laughs> yeah. Oh, where are you? Where are you? So I think for me, there's something about as long as we've done something different, because I think we I think sometimes we can just sit there passively. So I think it is something about coming out of the shadows, doing something different. But it is. You know, nature teaches patience. You know, mm. tides, you know, we people say, oh, I miss the tide. But in most places in, in the earth, there's another tide in 12 It's coming hours. back. Yeah, it's yeah, coming yeah, back. It's coming back. So mm. let's just get ready for that and let's be better prepared for the next tide. Or, you know, so we've got uh, seasons again. You know, a lot of places have four seasons, but there are places in the earth that only have two. Um, but nevertheless, there are seasons. And so it changes. So it's like, you know what? Um, even at a tide, I mean, we're tidal where I live. And it always amazes me that uh, low tide is is at half a metre because the metre, you know, I won't bore you, but anyway, half a metre is the low tide. Uh, high tide is six and a half metres. So there's six metres between high and low tide. Now, when you're standing on low tide, with your feet on the ground, with the water lapping your toes, it's hard to believe that there's going to be that much water above your toes. Yeah, you know, there's going to be six meters of water in in less than you know six hours or something. But the other thing is, is when you look at tides, it's that if we're looking for something at high tide, you know, like oh, I'm, I'm searching for the for the answer to my problem. If we go looking for it at high tide, it might be covered up by the water. We might have to wait for low tide because yeah. low tide is when the water's retreated and suddenly we see the rocks or we see whatever the tide has been hiding. So things that... are clearer. Yes. So I think I think there's I think we can learn so much from nature. There's a surprise. Um about that whole patience, about timing about um the other week for instance um i mean again i've been doing this 20 years and i still find new insight but on this particular day i was doing a recording for the podcast and i was sort of telling to everybody look look at the landscape in front of you pick a part of the landscape that represents your current problem in front of you and then suddenly it was as if oh hang on a minute i'm only looking at the 180 degrees in front of me There's another 180 degrees behind, behind. me. Behind, yeah. And so for me, it was, oh my golly, how, uh, yeah, we need to turn around. So I think, so I think the seeds are having patience, make sure that we're looking at the right, you know, timing's right. So, you know, things do happen in the winter, but you get more growth in the spring. So it's that, you know, are we ready for that? So, so that we, we might that might question our you know how's our well being are we prepared and ready for everything that's to come or do we just need to spend a bit of time getting some good sleep eating the right things exercising and not forcing our way to do something now because yeah it feels like we're in the winter so I just need to hunker down you know eat nice nurturing things and and the time will be right for my new idea in the spring and you know it isn't necessarily the spring but it is a spring in your whatever that relates to within your idea mm, a spring phase in your life for yes. sure yeah yeah mm. very good thank you so much Alison smith author trainer coach and the author of can see the wood for the trees the podcast host of landscaping your life with Alison smith Thank you for helping us see how nature can help us solve our problems, basically, and get unstuck. Thanks, Roberta. <laughs> this has been wonderful. And before you go, where can we find you on the internet so that we um, learn more? There's lots of Alison Smiths, so you're better off going for Landscaping Your Life. So Landscaping Your Life on Amazon will find the book, um, Landscaping Your Life on podcasts, because Landscaping Your Life is not used by many people. So mm -hmm. Landscaping Your Life on LinkedIn will find me. 
on YouTube will find me. So yeah. Thank you so much. Your life. Landscaping your life with Alison Smith. This has been wonderful indeed. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify and stay tuned for more episodes to come. <laughs>